many of you know this urinal? This is the first question I got asked in a course on the literary avant-garde, and there, I was the only one who didn't know the answer. Not a great start. This isn't just a urinal, I was told. This is Marcel Duchamp's fountain, possibly one of the most famous pieces of modern art. Turns out, this urinal is famous because it shocked back in 1917. But honestly, do you find this shocking? I didn't. I laughed. And I realized that this wasn't quite the class I'd signed up for. You see, in one sense, the avant-garde is a movement of people in the early 20th century, including Duchamp, who were the first to push the boundaries of art beyond our comfort zone, with the purpose of shocking rather than pleasing. They created the art that we call modern. But they were called that because avant-garde literally means the forefront, the first line of advancing troops in a battle. Avant-garde art is beyond the edge of art, pre-hipster, the point at which we don't actually like it because it doesn't look like art yet. People have come to this class to find out what made this movement great, but here we were looking at what shocked 100 years ago rather than what shocks. This urinal is not avant-garde anymore. So I went looking for what was, the urinal of today. And this wasn't what was new. Everyone's calling that art new. But what we're afraid of becoming new, because new soon becomes normal. I started to think, what do we think are the main threats to our way of art right now? Probably, judging from the newspapers, something like a grand Hollywood-style robot takeover. R2-D2 painting better fresco than Michelangelo. Let's try that. A few rather dramatically worded Google searches later, I found people writing poetry in source code, the artificial language we've created to communicate with computer systems. These poems mingle human and artificial languages. It's literally cyborg poetry. Now, until this point, I'd always been kind of anti-tech. I'd find bookshops with signs in the window saying, Kindle bearers be warned, and absolutely did not trust smartphones. This should have freaked me out, but it didn't. Now, maybe I'm more millennial than I know, but here, my first reaction was, cool. And the more I looked, the more it became clear that this new form of poetry was entirely and beautifully human. Source code is a language that's built to do things to make computers make things happen. And this means the code poetry can practice what it preaches. Because of the way we are using this capability, I really believe that code poetry is the avant-garde of a new era of human beauty. And I'm going to show you a few poems now that help to illustrate this. These are grouped into three rough categories based on the type of audience that they're written for. And the first one is human readable. Here you can read through the natural language words quite easily like in this poem, Promises, which reads, if I make you a new promise, that together love shall bind us, then will you catch me as we fall, return my promise, reject the darkness? It's written for humans. It looks stylish and futuristic, but sometimes doesn't do anything because the computer can't quite read it. Now, the second type is machine and human readable. This is a poem that's written for both. You can just about get a sense of the natural language words from the poem, but here the computer function is the priority. This poem, Spiral, is about the vicious circle of conspiracy theorists making absurd logical errors and then seeing evidence in physics. The golden ratio in a sky full of chemtrails. You can see the words spiral, chemtrails, proof, blue sky, fractal, power, spin, and lies, and the last line reads, chemicals just brush off into the air blowing with lies of Washington. But now, look what happens when I press go. A spiral that conforms to the golden ratio. Now, the third type is fully machine readable. This is a stylish, elegantly written piece of code and can be beautiful for as many reasons as natural poetry. I found some examples from online forums of what people are calling beautiful code. And this first type is just 
beautifully laid out on the page. The second checks if a number is prime really efficiently. And with the third, the user was simply astonished by the power in these simple few lines. Now, these poems may all look unnatural, strange, but actually co-poetry is everywhere beneath our noses. Here's another example of this last type. A fully machine-readable piece of co-poetry that does a lot. <laughs> and there is much, much more. Beautiful code is behind the TV that you watch, the music that you listen to, the live updates at the bus stop. Your phone, your laptop, all of them were written into being. An app is written with 50,000 lines of code. A car with 100 million. These are the modern works of literature. But why do we need to think of them as poetry to appreciate them as beautiful? What these developers are doing is intensely creative, but the presence of their code beneath these pieces of technology seems to be some kind of dirty secret. This code is just functional. It's just for telling the computer what to do, right? It's just there. And this is where the situation with Duchamp can help to shed some light. The toilet was a revolution in sanitation, but people couldn't accept something so purely functional into the realm of beauty and art. That's why it was so shocking. It seems like, 100 years later, we're at a similar boundary now with source code. But there is an entirely new kind of beauty in this language, which code poetry can help us to see. That is why these pieces of code are today's avant-garde. And this is partly because the mingling of beauty and functionality in these poems makes it clear that our separation of art and science, poetry, technology, is far from natural. Both poetry and source code are products of a fundamental human desire to create and communicate. Artificial doesn't have to mean alien. Paintings are artificial representations of what we see in the world or our mind. There seems to be a lot of reluctance or fear surrounding the invasion of technology into our creative space, but these poems and this language are not alien to us. We wrote them. Perhaps the people who visited Duchamp's first exhibition all those years ago went back home to their own toilet, took one look at it, tipped their head to the side, and saw it slightly differently, just for a moment. Co-poetry has the potential for far more. Thank you. <laughs>